Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. I am frequently asked, if time travel were ever to be possible, when would I like to go back to? What would I like to see? What mystery would I hope to solve? Now, I have given a few different answers to this question over the years, but when I started thinking about making today's video, I realised that there is at least one more thing that I need to add to my list. It would be, I think, incredible to get an opportunity to see the lost palace of Nonsuch while it was still standing and still in use, while it was, if you like, in its prime. And so today, I want to look at the extant information we have available to us now, in the hope that we might be able, at least partially, to get an idea of the appearance and the history of this now lost palace. Let's take a look. The Surrey village of Cuddington, with its manor house and church, once stood on the site of what would later become Nonsuch Palace. Cuddington sat within Hampton Court Chase. This was the hunting ground that Henry VIII had created in 1537. The site for Nonsuch Palace sits just over six miles from Hampton Court Palace, and by my calculations that would take a person just over half an hour to cover if they were riding on a cantering horse. Henry's building work on this site took place between 1538 and 1546. Martin Biddle, who led the team of archaeologists that excavated the Nonsuch site in 1959, explains that, quote, the structure was perhaps substantially complete by January 1541, but the work of decoration continued. By November 1545, the cost amounted to £24,536, which is around £10 million in today's money. Half as much again as had been spent on Hampton Court during the same period. When Henry died on the 28th of January 1547, the palace was still unfinished. The palace was, however, evidently usable before this phase of building work was completed in 1546, as it was recorded that Queen Catherine Parr could dine there in 1544, and also that Henry VIII stayed there twice in the following year, 1545. The second of these occasions was during his summer progress, and at that time, the king stayed at Nonsuch Palace for a number of days. As for the beginning of these building works in 1538, they represented a kind of dual celebration, both for the birth of Henry's son, Prince Edward, and also Henry's own 30-year reign. Henry could fund this ambitious building project because he now had lots of lovely money that had flooded into the royal coffers due to the dissolution of the monasteries. Additionally, the works also benefited from a new, readily available supply of building materials that came from the demolished ecclesiastical buildings surrounding the site of Nonsuch. The choice of the name, Nonsuch, was made because this was designed to be a palace with a level of luxury and craftsmanship that Henry hoped would have no parallel. In this palace, apparently, Henry wished to best his French rival, Francis I, whose own chateau at Chambord was swiftly becoming a veritable jewel in the French countryside, settled in the heart of the Loire Valley. Nonsuch would, however, not find its claim to magnificence through size. Indeed, in this regard, it would be outstripped by its near neighbour, Hampton Court Palace. It is thought that Nonsuch was around a third the size of Hampton Court. The exterior, as we can see, was covered in some kind of decoration. This work is often referred to as stucco work, a series of three-dimensional figures that project out of panels of medium-relief plaster work. Henry employed the Italian artist Nicholas Bellin to ornament his palace. Bellin had previously been employed by Francis I. Indeed, he had worked on his chateau at Fontainebleau. Francis would later accuse this artist of embezzlement. According to Biddle, quote, the decorative scheme was thus some 900 feet, 274 metres in length, with a minimum average height 
of 24 feet, 7.5 metres. It therefore covered a surface of some 21,600 square feet, 2,055 metres squared. Today, we are reliant on the extant images of this palace, its grounds and artefacts, in addition to textual eyewitness accounts from visitors, if we are to grasp in any way how this palace might have looked, its decorative schemes, what it might have felt like to walk through its gates. On this note, if we stay with Biddle, we learn that, quote, all we know of the South Front is that it probably included representations of Ovid's metamorphosis, and Hofnegel's watercolour seems to bear this out. The inward-facing walls of the inner court carried, however, what was probably, in terms of programme, the key to the whole scheme. The uppermost of the three registers presented the figures of the Roman emperors, from Julius Caesar to Aemilianus. The middle register displayed on the king's side the gods of the classical world, and on the queen's side, the goddesses. The lower register on the king's side showed the life of Hercules, from the cradle to his death on Mount Oeta, and on the queen's side, the liberal arts and virtues. The figures were identified with mottos, imperative and admonitory, written in letters of gilded lead. From the centre of the south side of the inner court, the figure of King Henry VIII, with Prince Edward by his side, surveyed these scenes. And so, in addition to ornamenting Henry's glorious new palace, these decorations were, Biddle claims, intended to act as a guide, an educational tool for that prince whose birth none such was built to celebrate. The walls of this palace were, therefore, intended to support Prince Edward's development, his growth into a virtuous Christian prince and an ideal king-in-waiting. If we'd like an idea of how the interior space looked, we may wish to turn to this portion of the monument to Lady Jane Lumley that can be found in the Lumley Chapel at Cheam, as it is believed that the location depicted here is the only surviving representation of the interiors at Nonsuch. If you are wondering why this memorial to this woman might feature images from the interiors at Nonsuch, well, that can be explained because Jane was the daughter of a later owner of Nonsuch Palace. Not only that, but she was the daughter of the man who is in fact credited with completing it, Henry Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel, of whom more in a moment. Nonsuch was designed and built by the same people who were also responsible for the building work at Hampton Court Palace. And as such, I think it's unsurprising that the royal apartments would be arranged in a similar fashion at both sites. Simon Thurley explains that, quote, the king's lodging was sited on the west and the queen's on the east. They were connected on the south side by a privy gallery facing the court. For a better idea of the layout of Nonsuch, we can look to this floor plan, which Biddle explains as follows, quote, the palace was arranged around two principal courts. The northern or outer court, entered by a turreted gatehouse, was built in brick and stone in the normal Tudor manor. And as would be found in base court at Hampton Court, this outer court held lodgings for Henry's guests. On the south side, a second gatehouse led to the southern or inner court. The ground floor of this court was built in stone, but the upper levels, corresponding to the principal apartments on the first floor, the king's side to the west, the queen's side to the east, with a garret floor above, were timber framed. The timbers themselves were invisible, encrusted with plaques of carved and gilded slate, but they held three registers of stucco duro panels, as mentioned previously, moulded in high relief. As at Hampton Court, at Nonsuch, there was a suitably spacious kitchen complex and separate privy kitchen to ensure that Henry, his family, household and guests were all well provided for. By 1550 at the latest, a banqueting house had been added to the site, separate from the main palace building, probably in open parkland at first. Nonsuch Palace was sold to Henry Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel. It was his daughter's tomb that we looked at a moment ago. This sale was made during the reign, and thus on the orders of, Queen Mary I in 1556. And despite the length of time, nearly 20 years, 
that had elapsed between the beginning of the building work under Henry VIII and this sale, Arundel found that his new purchase still required work. According to his biographer, this work was needed, quote, in buildings, reparations, pavements and gardens, and that by completing it, Arundel was respecting, quote, the first intent of the said king, his old master. This is a sign, I would say, that Henry's own vision for non-such palace had not been fully realised before his death in 1547, but also that those around him knew what his vision was. It is suggested that Arundel was left to finish the interiors and the landscaping, that he added gardens and an orchard. In my video on Thomas Tallis that I will leave linked, I mentioned that it has been suggested that his composition, Spem in Allium, might have been commissioned in 1571 by Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, and that it might have first been performed at the home of Henry Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel. The question is, if this is the case, which home is this referring to? It could, of course, be the London residence Arundel House, which I mentioned in my video on Tallis. But it has also been suggested that non-such palace might be another potential location for this first performance. In the 1580s, the space that probably stood empty beside the banqueting house was filled with the so-called Grove of Diana. This Grove of Diana would be described in a 17th century journal, which we are going to be discussing shortly. At around the same time as this landscaping work was going on, the palace would play host to the signing of the aptly named Treaty of Nonsuch on the 10th of August 1585. Through this treaty, Queen Elizabeth I vowed to provide military support to Dutch forces who were seeking to challenge Spanish rule. The move was arguably a risky one. After all, before the decade was over, Spain and her allies would mount their famous but ultimately failed armada against Elizabeth and her England. In around 1590, Anthony Watson produced a brief and true description of the splendid and most royal house that is commonly called Nonsuch. I will leave an open access version of this text in the description box and you should be able to read it for free. In this text, Watson asserts the perfect placement of this palace within the landscape, not only on account of its sheer beauty, but also for the access it provided to necessary natural resources. Watson also offers the reader an idea of what you might have seen, if only you were lucky enough to be allowed to enter Nonsuch and explore her grounds. The crown, meaning Queen Elizabeth I, reclaimed Nonsuch in 1592. Elizabeth's successor, James VI and I, settled the palace on his wife Anne of Denmark as her jointure. Anne and James's son Charles I behaved similarly, granting Nonsuch to his consort, Henrietta Maria. Between 1629 and 1630, during a visit to London by a Dutch deputation, one of the secretaries employed for this mission, Abram Booth, made use of any free time he had to indulge in some sightseeing around the country, and he described his experiences in his journal. H.J. Loal offers this translation of Booth's description of Nonsuch Palace. Quote, Nonsuch the finest and most ornamental of all the royal residences, although not one of the largest. It was founded by King Henry VIII, who erected it in a healthy and pleasant place for himself as a retreat. First upon entry is a square courtyard, in which stands a pretty fountain. The walls around the courtyard are decorated with ashlar and skilfully carved sculpture of very pure white stone and in the same manner, the outside, which opens onto the garden. In the first walled garden, which is kept very neat, are several fountains, pyramids, and other ornaments. From there, one goes into a second garden, which seems to have something in common with both gardens and wildernesses, because there are many lovely footpaths, arbours, and other pleasant spots formed out of the wild so that almost no distinction can be drawn in amenity between nature and art. Indeed, they are so intermingled. Art copies nature so nicely, and nature shows art so much in place, 
that no one needs search for one within the other. From here, one goes into a shady wood, where in golden letters is written Lucas Diane, meaning the forest of Diana. Here and there, in suitable places, sweet verses alluding to the histories of Diana and Actian are set. It is thickly planted with large oak trees, richly provided with small summer houses and bowers, and very nicely formed, with levels, risings, falls, hills, straight and winding footpaths, the variety of which causes a pleasant cheerfulness. In one corner, cave-like, the resting place of Diana was made with rough stones, shells and green stuff, which copy nature very curiously. Therein, the goddess Diana, with two of her nymphs, and on a small hill with three of his dogs, Actian, whom Diana seems to sprinkle with water, which bursts forth when taps are turned on. Around the house and wood is a beautiful park full of game. To conclude, it is one of the most agreeable places that one can imagine. Through the English Civil War and the subsequent interregnum, Crown properties, none such included, were confiscated, and thus the palace and its grounds became the spoils of the parliamentarian victors. None such palace was, however, returned to the crown at the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. At this point, King Charles II, as he was then recognised to be, returned from exile to sit upon his executed father's throne. In 1671, None such palace was given to Barbara Villiers, Lady Castlemaine, by her royal lover, King Charles II. A little over a decade later, apparently with prodigious gambling debts to settle, Lady Castlemaine chose to have none such palace demolished, so that she could sell off its building materials and thus obtain the money to pay her creditors. The destruction at this time was total. So what do you think of none such palace? of what we can reconstruct from the extant evidence, of its history, of its destruction. As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. But I'd also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement, and the more engagement video gets, the more YouTube shares it out, and that will help to grow this community. As we've been talking about palaces, I think maybe a castle or a palace or a royal emoji would be something to go for this time. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the other place you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? And if you like the channel, let some pals know about it too. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel and if you think you are subscribed, now is the best time to check to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu that will appear and that way YouTube claims. They will tell you when I've next uploaded and also when I'm next planning to go live, which I do to talk about the history news and I know you are not going to want to miss that. We have now got our fail safe. Please head over to my website www.katrinamarchant.com. It will be linked and as you can see on screen. If you go to the contact page, on the contact page you will see there's a box. If you put your email address in that box, you will be added to my mailing list and that will let me send you an email once a week with information about what I've been up to and also with links for my content for the next few days. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.